Hello, this is Patrick O'Shaughnessy, and this is the fourth module in the series Statistical Methods for Analyzing Data Obtained in the Lab or Field. In this module, we will kind of advance our understanding of the kind of the strength of association, so to speak, of the regression model by calculating an R squared value and to understand the difference between R squared and R. Here is the module map for this series of modules all related to linear regression and graphing. And you can see here that we are uh, adding on to our understanding of the regression model that we have already seen in module three and then in graphing techniques in module one as the essential modules in this grouping. Okay, we'll begin with uh, the coefficient of correlation R. That is the standard variable used for this term. And it could otherwise be called the Pearson product moment coefficient of correlation. And uh, there is another type of coefficient of correlation referred to as the Spearman's. Uh, so that you should refer to this as the Pearson in a, in a publication. Okay, the standard definition for it is a measure of the strength of the linear relationship between two variables x and y. And the, this concept of strength uh, always comes up in the st statistical textbooks and the idea that's linear. So you can see the definition here um, of R involves those sums of squares that we saw in the previous module that were utilized to uh, determine the slope and then ultimately the intercept from that, which includes the sums of squares of the x's and the y's in the numerator. Recall that that is the x's minus their mean times the y's minus their mean. Now, they, they can go, because they're not squared terms, uh, this numerator can go negative or positive. And so r itself will go negative or positive. The denominator here, in a sense, normalizes the numerator to, to encapsulate it to values between minus 1 and 1. So r does range from minus 1 to 1, where an r in the middle somewhere of 0 implies no linear relationship at all. There's no strength to it whatsoever. So as, of course, the linear relationship increases with r approaching minus 1 or 1, so does this strength of the relationship itself. So let's just take a look at some examples here. So here's an example of a lousy linear relationship, 0 0.106 for the r value. Then you can see that this highly scattered data, but, but more importantly from the idea of a linear relationship, Right, so if we're at some sort of a x value, it could have a low value of y and then a very high value of y. There's, there's no way that we can kind of determine some sort of a increase in x corresponding to an increase in y or, or decrease in y out of this. So we, we result from that as a, a, a low correlation coefficient of r. Now here's an example where R is much higher, and as we can see correspondingly, this our visual sense of the strength is also has increased. Uh, we can see an obvious increase in Y as X increases here, even though there is some fluctuation back and forth uh, between the X's themselves. And likewise, if it was negative, uh, we would have an association where Y is decreasing with an increase in X. So now you, you may say to yourself, this, these last two are have pretty high R values, you know, almost approaching 0.9, but uh, there's still pretty a lot of scatter. And so it does give you an idea of what R tells you, and you have to be up in the R of, say, 0.95 or higher to, to have the type of association you might expect out of an instrument you're using and its relationship to a standard or something like that, right? That it's uh, you would you would want those points to be really close to a, a perfectly straight line, uh, <clears throat> which implies an R getting very close to one, and an R somewhere down, say less than 0.6, uh, is getting into a, a kind of a zone of relationship that that may not be applicable to you, whereas uh, 0.6 may be perfectly okay in the health world, where it's very difficult and there's so many other variables affecting. A person's health outcome, for example, uh, uh, body weight versus uh, diabetes or something like that, where uh, 
uh, an R of 0.6 would be a, a really good association. Okay, how do we go about getting this value? Well, thanks to software, we can go to Excel. There's a function called Corel. You just put in the column of X values and then follow it with a comma, then highlight the column of Y values, put a bracket at the end and hit enter and you'll get the number. Now, just some comments about R. The sine of R is equal to the sine of the slope. As R is positive, so will the slope be negative, so will the slope be negative. But don't ever think that there's a relationship directly between R and beta 1. This comes up, uh, however, say when you're comparing instrument A versus instrument B. You have two instruments, you're hoping that they are very similar. So shouldn't, when they're both low, they're both low, when they're both high, they're both high, with a very closely identical numbers. So in that case, you would hope that the slope is one, right? As for whatever value of X you get, you get a value of Y, which is the instrument B. And so in that case, you will get an R of hopefully close to one and a beta one close to one. But that's an example where there's some confusion, but uh, don't ever uh, consider them to be identical. The other big uh, concern that statistics books all say is you know, high correlation does not necessarily imply high causality. You can have a great correlation, but that doesn't mean that X actually affects Y. So you have to be careful when you state your results. These two values are highly correlated, but you can't then say that one affects the other, that there's some causality. And there's another reason for that that we'll get into, that R is the wrong way of getting at that if you want to talk about causality. And there's all sorts of uh, interesting little uh, kind of comical relationships you can see out there on the internet for examples of this. Of, you know, uh, stock market prices are related to uh, people playing baseball or, you know, things like that, that they can show, oh yeah, there's a lot of really uh, high correlation, but um, uh, obvious, obviously no causality. So you have to be careful of that. Uh, you can perform a test on R just as you can on beta. Uh, but as you'll see, the, the p-value you get for the test on beta will be identical to the p-value you get on a test of the correlation. But you will often, often see that they will give it the correlation r value in a table and followed by the p-value associated with it to demonstrate that yes, say it's 0.659 and it has a p-value of 0 0.03, therefore it is, it, is a, it is significantly different from zero. You can prove that. Okay, now we're moving on to the coefficient of determination, r squared. So, yes, it's called r squared because if you square r, you will get this thing called r squared. r squared is mathematically equivalent to the square of r. But since it's squared, it can't go negative. So it's always going to be positive and between 0 and 1. So if you're saying this is like, why, why even bother with this coefficient of determination if we already have the correlation coefficient? Well, it, it has a, an extra meaning to it, as we'll see in the next slide. It provides a measure of how well the deterministic model predicts y, not the strength of the model, but how well the model containing the x predicts y. That's, that's pretty important. Okay, before it was just, are the two associations linear? It doesn't say, r doesn't say anything about x affecting y. Here, yes, r squared does say something about how x affects y. For example, if r squared equals 0.75, then you can say that the straight line model relating y to x can explain or you know, kind of account for 75% of the variation present in the y values. So you can think of r squared truly as a percentage 
of accountability, so to speak. So what does that mean back to the original models we had? It means that the deterministic model explains 75% of what's going on between X and Y, and the other 25% is explained by eta. The randomness is 25% of it. So you can imagine too, as you get R squared of one, there is no random component. The points all follow the line perfectly. So keep that kind of concept in mind, and that's what R squared implies. Okay, so another point, as with R, R squared is not equal to beta one. Don't think it's equivalent to the slope. Um, again, you would expect that if beta one is around zero, then you might say, oh, R squared must be around zero. Another beta one near zero is a flat line, right? However, it all depends on your units. If your X values go from one to a million and your uh, Y values go from zero to one, which is possible, you'd have a very, 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 very flat line, but it could have a very, very strong uh, slope to it. So uh, you, can't, you can't expect that, or it's not, not necessarily the case always, that a slope near zero means R squared near zero. And again, or maybe one more added feature that is counterintuitive is that R squared is not a measure of the appropriateness of the straight line model. You see this all the time in the literature. I have a high R squared, therefore my model is a good, good indicator of X versus Y. Well, yes, maybe within that region that you've measured, but there are many different uh, scenarios in which you may have a curved relationship uh, and you just happen to measure in a portion of that curve that is relatively straight and you've come up with an R squared of say 0 0.95 and, and you think everything's okay but uh, and maybe within that region it's still okay but it doesn't you can't say it specifically okay we're gonna now dig into this a little deeper in terms of how R squared is actually calculated and it's per perhaps best to do this kind of pictorially so first of all we have say a scatter plot of data xy pairs as shown on the left one potential line through that data is actually a flat line it's the line where the at the mean of the y's you can say well that doesn't seem to be a very good fit but is what may be called a naive assumption of just saying the best fit or at least a potential deterministic model is that y is equal to some constant which is the average now obviously that would not be um, good in this case so there is going to be some error just as we saw in the first slides between the points and the line in this case we can define them as the values of y, there they are at each point, minus, in this case, the average, y bar. And then we're gonna square them up and we're gonna sum them. So that's our sums of squares. They're gonna be sums of squares of the y's only. All right, moving along, we would like to see something like this. We have a best fit line based on those values that come out of the minimum least squares estimates and in this case now the error between the points in the line is going to be the y's minus the, the caret y caret i's right the ones on the line so we call those the sse's so r squared technically the way it's computed again is not based on computing r and then squaring it it's computed this way and it makes it more intuitive that you can see that r squared is a relative difference between assuming a flat line model the sums of the squares of the y's minus assuming that the best fit line uh, occurs so we have SSY minus SSE divided by the SS of Ys. So this is the relationship. You can imagine if, the, if these points are all on the line, 
then this SSE value is going to go to zero. Right? There's going to be no difference between the yi's and the y carrots. They're all on the line. They're going to be all zero. So then SSE goes to zero, and you see you end up with SSYY over SSYY. You end up with one. Okay, so there's that's how you get to a, a perfect fit line in terms of the, the number here. Now, what if all these points really were buckshot? And the best fit line is, is pretty darn flat. That would be the case. So you can see then there would be very little difference between this assumption and the best fit line is actual best fit line, which is also flat. Then these two terms in the numerator are essentially the same and R squared goes to zero. So that's just a, a shorthand way of trying to, again, uh, visualize what's going on here with R squared. Now we can go back to the data analysis uh, regression function and display the output here. And we can now interpret the topmost portion of this output. And uh, here is R squared displayed, 0.816. And so we can say that somewhere around 81, 82% of the variability in the Ys is attributed to the deterministic model containing the Xs. There are also, as you can see, a multiple R. Uh, this is actually the Pearson correlation coefficient, only just the absolute value of it. However, you could go down to the slope value here and note that it is positive, and therefore this would be a positive 0.9 for R. Of course, if the slope was negative, then the multiple R value times minus 1 would give you the, uh, the true correlation coefficient in its negative sense. And then lastly, there is an adjusted R squared, which is used typically for... Uh, multiple variable regression it's more than one X and it helps to account for this inflation in R squared that's uh, noticed that the more X's you put in uh, the more you can kind of fine-tune the relationship and therefore R squared goes up naturally as you increase the number of X variables the classic example is the use of polynomial expressions where you go from X squared to X cubed X to the four every time you do that R squared will go up so the adjusted R squared uh, helps to compensate for that. Okay, finally, using R and R squared. When do you use them? Use R when you're concerned with whether one variable is correlated with another variable. That seems very obvious. That's why it's called the correlation coefficient. You'll see abuses of this all the time where people use R squared when really all they care about is does do the xy pairs increase for example as as the x's increase and the y increase the other way to think about it is that this is a two-way association when when you really uh get bear down on it you you realize i don't care which one's x and which one's y i just want to know whether they are their relationships are linear or not so example you're correlating weight with blood pressure and you're just interested in the strength of their linear relationship so in that case i don't care which one's on the x-axis blood pressure i've got a show here as weight um, but blood pressure could just as easily be on the x-axis right i don't i'm not interested in how weight predicts blood pressure and so in this case as well there's no regression analysis needed because weight is not predicting blood pressure. I'm only interested in their linear association. And I will compute here an R of 0.77 and tell the world about that and maybe do a, a test on to make sure it's not a significant, make sure it's significantly different from zero, which in this case it most likely would be. Okay, so when you use R squared, you should be pretty well primed up for this. You're going to use R squared when you are interested in how a change in one variable affects a change in another variable. So this you could think of as a one-way association, not two-way. Only the predictor variable is X, and it is affecting the Y. In the previous example, again, either could be called X or Y. So it's a one-way association now. And so an example, just using ex the exact same thing, um, but in this case, the researcher really is interested in whether 
I can measure somebody's weight and it will predict their blood pressure. Okay. And so now we do have a scenario where um, we have an X value weight and a dependent value blood pressure. And now you are going to apply a regression analysis and an associated R squared value. And you can see it's at 0.598. And so in this case, kind of a, a lousy association, only 59.8% uh, of the model is containing X is predicting the Y. The rest is the, the kind of the noise in the, in the system. Now, if this is the case too, uh, you can see that if you squared R 0.77, you square it, you're going to get 0.598. So it's interesting to note that um, squaring something less than one ends up in a smaller number even. So just, just to be forewarned about that. Okay, and with that,